So we are live. Hello, everyone. I am Rashad Robinson, president of Color of Change. And we are um, here to um, have a conversation as part of the series um, um, around the Black Response. The BlackResponse.org, the BlackResponse.org is the platform that Color of Change um, has been driving action and change. And what we've been doing over the last couple of weeks is talk to leaders and experts and those who are working um, both in policy, government, media, and on the front lines to help um, ensure that we build the type of power um, that not only gets us through this crisis, but makes us anew um, going forward. That doesn't just return us to a, a normal that was insufficient, but drives the type of change um, necessary. Um, as part of those discussions, um, we've also been highlighting um, policies and actions that everyday people can take um, to work to build more power to change the rules. And so I'm really, incredibly excited. I'm here in New York City. I'm still at my apartment, uh, you know, uptown where uh, once again, it's very quiet here in New York as we hear ambulances up and down. So you may hear some ambulances in the background um, as um, some of our hospitals and medical centers continue um, to um, experience um, large numbers of people going in and particularly large numbers of black folks. Um, and brown folks um, um, experiencing not just the impact of this virus, but the virus of bad decisions that preceded it and the virus of bad decisions that continue to follow it. And so I am just incredibly excited to welcome um, my friend, um, a true champion of, of, of social justice work, but also someone who has spent years working on the inside to make change happen. Uh, Stacy Abrams from the great state of Georgia. Welcome, Stacy. Thank you so much for having me. Well, it's, it's my pleasure. And for those of you who have not uh, been following Stacy's career, um, Stacy was in uh, the Georgia House from um, 2007 to 2017. Um, between 2011 and 2017, she was the leader of the Democrats, the minority leader in, in the House, um, did a lot of work around ensuring that tax policy was equitable, um, on education, on criminal justice, um, and so much more. Um, her run for governor was a, a run that captured the sort of hopes, dreams, and aspirations of so many of us. The Color of Change PAC was proud to endorse Stacy in her run. And since then, she's been um, talked about for so many different um, offices that I can't even count. Um, and at the same time, um, has spent has taken her time to really work to build infrastructure through her founding of Fair Fight, Fair Fight Action, and Fair Count, uh, working on issues of voting rights um, and democracy, as well as ensuring that we get an accurate and full count in the census. And so I'd like to start there, Stacey. I'd like you to talk a little bit as we sort of face down um, these challenges um, with the coronavirus, we can also look at all the ways in which the structural flaws in our democracy led us to some of these challenges. Um, inability uh, to cast a vote, um, inability to have accurate census, all of these things are sort of part of the challenge. I'd love for you to maybe talk to folks a little bit about that, but really talk to us about what we should be doing, where we should be focusing, what is, what's sort of next, and how should people be thinking about um, their activism? Sure. First, Rashad, thank you so much for the work you're doing, the work that Color of Change does. Thank you to Color of Change PAC again for the support in 2018. And, and I want to start there. In the wake of the election on November the 6th, I was faced with uh, an opponent who was allowed to run the, basically he was in charge of the election. He was the judge, the jury, as well as the contestant. And between November 6th and November 16th, I had 10 days to really grapple with what happened. And a major part of our campaign was that we centered communities of color. We didn't exclude anyone, but we intentionally talked about the inequities, the structural inequities, and the tendency in our politics to ignore the needs of people of color, assuming as a Democrat, and I know this is a nonpartisan group, but the assumption that tends to be on the Democratic side is that they will come as opposed to they need service as well. And so our campaign really focused on that issue, but we also focused on how do we bring together the largest coalition of voters that reflect the democracy and the diversity of Georgia. And we succeeded. We had the highest turnout 
in Georgia history for Democrats. But I did not become governor. And in the 10 day period between the election and my non-concession day, I spent time thinking about what work could I do if I didn't have the title of governor. I've spent 25 years plus working on issues of democracy. I didn't always frame it that way in my head, but it's always been core to who I am and what I do. Whether it was registering voters or fighting against voter suppression or running for office or starting a small business to get capital to minority businesses and to women-owned businesses. What happened in that 10-day period was that I thought about the three pieces of infrastructure. Number one is the fundamental power of the vote. And we talk about voting as an act, but I want us to think about it as it is power. That is why they are working so hard to stop us. And so the first responsibility we have is to stop thinking about the vote as something you do on a Tuesday. And remember that it is the single most effective weapon that any member of a democracy has. It is the only way we can speak to, that we're guaranteed we're allowed to speak to our leaders and either hire them or fire them. That's, that's what voting is. But it's also one of the few powers that only works when it's linked together with others. And so our first responsibility is to shift our temperament about what voting is and stop thinking about it as a choice of do I vote for this person or that person or not vote and think about it as I have a superpower and do I use it to save my community or do I not? And so Fair Fight Action and Fair Fight 2020 are designed to remove the barriers, to remove the villains from the story, to make certain that you have access to register and stay on the rolls, that you can cast a ballot and your ballot gets counted. But the second part of what I thought about during that 10 days, and it was a really long 10 days, was that we often, underestimate the mechanics of how this happens, not just how you vote, but how the decisions about who we vote for and how money are, how monies are spent, how those choices are made. And so the second thing I created is Fair Count. It is a single issue organization. All we do is the census because we can't think about the census as something that happens every 10 years. The census happens to us every day. We only talk about it every 10 years. But the census directs $1.5 trillion. And just in this year alone, if black people are undercounted, we will lose an estimated 1.7 million people. Black people will not be included in the census, which will cost our communities $3.3 billion every year. Wow. Those are dollars that don't go to, pu to protective equipment. Those are dollars that don't go to hospital beds. Those are SNAP benefits that don't get dispersed. That's WIC money that doesn't go to young babies. Those are real dollars and we lose them every year because they do not count us. And because we allow ourselves to cordon off this notion of the census to be this one once a decade issue. On the other side, the conservatives have weaponized the census. They have done deep research to figure out how to push people out of the conversation because they know not only do we lose the money, we lose the organizing power. In 2019, the Supreme Court said that partisan gerrymandering is permissible. That means that the only type of gerrymandering, the only weapon that, that politicians use to steal your votes in terms of how it's organized, when they draw political lines, they can either draw political lines so politicians can pick their voters, or they can draw the lines so voters can pick their leaders. The only unconstitutional way to draw the lines is racial gerrymandering. Well, if you want racial gerrymandering to be permissible, make sure nobody sees the races. That's why they're trying to undercount the census. That's why we have seen an underinvestment by the Trump administration of billions of dollars. And it's why we need to be very suspicious as they start to push back the dates. They've already announced that instead of the census closing in August, it's gonna close in October. That's fine. But the, the fine point is, and the fine print, is when will the data be available? When will they start sending information to the states to draw those lines? Because it's not just Congress, it's your city council, it's your school board, mm -hmm. it's your county commission, every level of government that controls our daily lives, whether you get to go outside, whether your frontline workers have to go back to work in the midst of a pandemic, that's decided by who gets elected based on these lines. And so we have to pay attention to the census. The last piece, is the Southern Economic Advancement Project, and then we'll talk about this yeah. in a minute. But if you think about the power of the vote and then the implements, the inputs that come from the census, the third is the policies that then come from the people we've elected and the monies we've allocated. And that means that we have to 
spend a lot of time thinking about how we translate progressive policy. I say translate it into Southern, but we also have to translate it into Black. Yeah. Because often po progressive policy presumes that everyone comes to the table with the same needs and the same capacities. And our communities are often systematically underinvested, which means we don't have the same capacity to respond to the ideas that are out there. We have to translate our public policy into black. We have to translate progressive policy into a way that understands the complexity of our communities. And this expands into other communities of color and to other communities of disadvantage. We can't allow progressive policy to simply be done to us. We have to be a part of developing it and understanding how it works. Absolutely. That's what we do. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so, so what people, so what, if you were, you know, as people were listening, what they, what they should have heard, right, was sort of a whole set of infrastructure that's built to deal with all the ways in which we um, have to build power, right? We can't win if we can't vote and our opponents know they can't win if we can. And so if we don't have infrastructure that actually allows us to get to the polls to ensure our, our votes are counted. Then we have infrastructure that's been designed to deal with the census, right? Because the census is an act of saying that we exist. And if we don't exist, if forces can make us not exist, they can control our ability to fight for a better future. They can control our ability to be heard and counted and visible. And part of democracy, right, is being heard, counted and visible, regardless of whether you're privileged or vulnerable in the majority or minority or in favor or out of favor with whoever may be in power. And then, right, we're talking about policy, right? And the ensuring that there's an equitable recovery, that we're not just thinking that a, a blanket policy over everything is gonna, is gonna help everyone. There's this, the saying that we use a lot of color change, we didn't make it up, but you know, when America gets the cold, black people get the flu. And, um, and so we can't keep overlaying the same sort of systems on top of the flu that we overlay over the cold. We have to ensure that we are in, um, fighting for a better future. And that's why racial justice is so important. So as we think about the coronavirus and as you sort of laid out those pieces, I'm interested if you could talk to folks about what the, um, what policies um, that you believe are most critical that we should be focused on as we are sort of facing down this recovery and the things that sort of both from an economic perspective um, and, um, and else and other that we should be, um, you know, putting our energy behind? We have to, there's a tendency for us to focus all of our attention on the top, on the presidency. And that is a critical issue. I do not underestimate it. And I do not devalue it but we have to be capable of thinking about it at all three levels. What we've seen in this pandemic is emblematic of what happens to communities of color, to black communities every day, which is that at the top, the incompetence of leadership ignores the science, but also ignores the effect of, of the decisions made and not made. And so we have to hold our leaders accountable at the very top for understanding that if there is not a national federal response to this issue, Local communities that are under-resourced cannot respond. We've heard this push through the last few weeks by Donald Trump to say that it should be the states that make the decisions about what happens. That sounds like an implementation of the you know, 10th Amendment states' rights, but what it is is truly a passing of the buck because he understands, as, do, as does Mitch McConnell, who said, let states go bankrupt, let them eat cake, that states are not equipped to handle the kind of pandemic that we've seen because of the systematic more than you know, 200 years, but certainly in the last 40 years, the devolution of responsibility that the federal government used to have for funding what states do. And so if you're in the South, for example, that means that you don't have the hospital infrastructure, the public health infrastructure for when COVID-19 hits. I live in Georgia. We have, as of this moment, more than 18,000 cases. And for a few weeks last month, Albany, Georgia, which most people have never been to, yep. was the fourth highest coronavirus rate in the world. It also happens to be in the poorest part of Georgia where two hospitals have shut down and you've got one regional hospital that's trying to grapple with multiple counties. What we have to understand is that the federal government has an obligation to building a national infrastructure of public health and we cannot let them off the hook. At the state level, though, I live in a state where the governor has decided to reopen 
business with this argument that people are being forced to sacrifice the economy or their lives. It's a false choice. The reason we have the Paycheck Protection Act, which is finally hopefully going to get funded, is so people don't have to go to work and risk their lives. If we actually funded the program effectively and we had the audit controls on to make sure it doesn't go to billionaires, then small businesses would not have to make this choice. They would have access to the resources they need. But at the state level, the other issue is unemployment insurance. If you're in the South and in the West, you have some of the weakest unemployment insurance benefits in the country which means that that extra $600 that the federal government approved is insufficient to meet your needs because you were already getting less than anyone else in the country. The same is true with public benefits. Everyone has access to SNAP theoretically, but are your benefits equal to your need? That's a state decision. Mm -hmm. And so we have to hold our state legislators and our governors accountable. And then at the very local level, long-term, we have to think about the zoning decisions that are made. What are, what's in our communities? Who is allowed to open a business? What are they held accountable for? We have to pay attention to all three levels of government. The okie doke that we often see is that we're told to focus only on the presidency and thereby exempt everyone else of their responsibilities. If we want to not only survive, but to restructure the inequities that we see in our systems, we have to understand and connect the dots between the decisions made and the level of government responsible for implementation. And that's what I'm pushing for. It's so it's so smart and so critical, right? Because so many decisions happen at the local level. You know, at Color of Change, we focused a lot over the years on district attorneys. And as we are now trying to ensure that people get released, right, particularly from uh, pretrial um, incarceration um, in places where social distancing is important. Now, district attorneys that we've spent time building relationships over the years are the, and putting in office are the people we can now pressure and engage to actually do that because most people are incarcerated at the local level, not at the federal level. Exactly. And so while we may look at the Trump um, uh, press conferences and be outraged, and yes, there are people under the federal government guidelines, the vast majority of people are not. And so with that sort of said, in terms of decision making, when the governor of Georgia reopened, he picked a set of, um, of businesses that it was kind of interesting, right? Like um, he picked beauty salons and, and nail shops and barber shops and gyms and bowling alleys, lots of places that are um, in, and places that have population centers, places that black people go. And you know, um, the sort of like, kind of like old school, like listening to my uncle and father and grandfather, like conspiracy theorists sometimes, but also paying attention to history and paying attention to all the ways in which Black people have been used as guinea pigs. I'm interested from the perspective um, of someone who um, is a leader in Georgia, has had elected office, is, um, understands the state well, sort of what is the message towards everyday people and what is, um, and how did that choice get made? Well, let's start with the second part first. I don't know. There is no logic in the decision. There is no science to underpin it. There was no discussion with those who are on the front lines. And it seems to me that it was simply a pol personal politics. Let me be the first to do this and let me pick places that people like. The problem is the people who are forced to go back to work in the state of Georgia, if that small business reopens, there is no capacity to say, no, I'm not coming back to work because in Georgia, we're a right to work state. If you decline to come back to work, that is grounds for being fired, which means these are people who could permanently lose their jobs if they refuse to come and risk their lives. Number two, there is no economic benefit because even if they show up at those jobs, the likelihood that they will have the, the concentration and the intensity of, of, um, of usage that would actually turn the economy around is almost negligible because most people are looking outside thinking, why would I go and get a tattoo when I'm worried about whether my child is going to learn? And so there is a disconnect in the logic. But I also think that there is just a deep disinterest in, humans, in human capacity. What Brian Kemp did, what other Southern governors have said they were going to do, they've just allowed him to be the first to try it, is what they've said is that we are not concerned about the lives of the people who rely on us the most, who are the most economically vulnerable, the least physically resistant and resilient, and have the least amount of choice in our system. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. That's what should disturb us all. And I, I want to just connect that to what's happening with vote by mail. Let's think about what happened to Wisconsin. That was a decision made to say that black and brown people in Milwaukee had to risk their lives in order to make a choice about who would be in charge of their judiciary. But these are the very same people who are affected by the choices made by that court. They were told that their lives had to be risked in order to participate in their democracy, not because they lacked the ability or the information, but because no one cared about what would happen to them. Whether it was their Republican legislature or the Supreme Court, those five who decided that they would be forced to go to the polls. I'm, I don't necessarily subscribe to conspiracy theories, but I do subscribe to the evidence of my eyes. Yes. And what I have seen yeah. again and again is not necessarily an intentionality to harm, but a disinterest in serving. Yeah. And that disinterest in service is more pernicious and more evil than anything else because it is the refusal to take responsibility when leaders refuse to do their jobs, they should not have them. Yeah. So as we think, so as we look at sort of the so the road ahead, right? The the federal government just um, did sort of a is doing is in the process of doing an intermediary sort of piece of legislation that's supposed to help small businesses. Um, the the proof will be in the results, and there's still a lot to be concerned about when money is flowing through big banks and um, small. The small business administration is overseeing it. A lot of our businesses will not have access to that capital and may not um, have the resources to get to it. Um, but um, there will be another. There will be another recovery at the federal level, and so I am interested, sort of, as as you are. Um, traveling around the country as you are um, looking not just at Georgia, but the rest of the country, what are the sort of things that you think are going to be critically important um, that we fight for um, in this next in this next phase of recovery? Sure. Number one is making certain the monies are in place for our democracy. The vote by mail piece is not the only part. It's making sure we have investment in vote by mail as well as in increasing the number of early voting sites and the length of time in which people can vote, as well as making sure we have the safest election day. And here's why. If you imagine 100 people crammed inside a small space to vote on election day, that is a recipe for disaster. But if you can get 75 people out of line because they voted by mail, you've made it 75% safer. Then you're left with 25 people. If you can get 10 of those people to vote early over the course of a couple of weeks, you've now more safely allowed them to make the choice of when to vote. Then you're just left with 15 people, 15 people who have to vote in person because they're disabled, because they are homeless, because they've been displaced by COVID-19, because evictions are pushing them out of their households, because they have language barriers, or because if you're African-American or Latino or Native American, because vote by mail tends to mean that you have a higher rate of rejection of your ballot and you simply can't trust the system because we've seen that happen in Georgia, in Florida, in Ohio, in Wisconsin, in Michigan. And so there's a legitimate reason for believing you need to be there in person. But if we can get that package done, which needs to be roughly between two and four billion dollars, that's the only way to secure the elections for 2020. That's number one. Number two is that the deployment of dollars has to understand the differences in our states. States that have high populations of communities of color, especially black, brown, and Native American, tend to have the weakest public infrastructure for public benefits. That means that we can't simply say, here are resources that need to go out. We need to be clear about the fact that if you're a SNAP beneficiary, you are likely unbanked, you are likely not filing a tax return, which means you will never see a stimulus check. I'm proud to be a part of Project 100, which is trying to solve this for 100,000 people, but we've got millions of people who will face this challenge. The third, to your point, is small businesses. We know that small businesses have a difficulty accessing capital, and if you're a small business, especially a small black business, the banks that left in 2008 never came back. And so often the monies that are deployed are not available to our communities because they simply do not have access to the banks. The state small business credit initiative that was done by Obama and Biden in 2010 actually is a fantastic platform for what can be done in the next recovery. And we should look at that program, which was state-based so it could respond to the very specific needs, but federally overseen so that we made sure that the monies went everywhere. 
That's really helpful. So I woke up this morning to um, a story in CNN about you talking about what we need to do um, moving forward um, um, in terms of election, right? Like the type of ticket that's going to mobilize folks. You've um, um, not been shy about talking about your qualifications in the great story um, that Melissa Harris Perry wrote in Elle magazine. Um, and and you've, um, you've been um, um, not just talking about like the position in terms of your interest, but um, both in terms of the people that you can mobilize, your experience, and the um, and the role of vice president. So I'm interested um, both in terms of the sort of elements of the story that talked about what is needed to win, um, right? Because as a as a person who um, wants to win the election so we can get the policy demands, not simply because we want to give politicians jobs, but we want to make people's lives better. I want you to talk about the sort of winning formula and what we need, but also sort of the the vision you have for the um, the type of things you believe you can do um, once in office. Oh, thank you. So first of all, Vice President Biden will choose the person that he thinks is most qualified to work with him. And there are a number of qualified candidates. My response is the fact, usually responds to the fact that I'm being asked a question. And it's a question I've been getting for a while now. People are a bit off put by my candidness, but I'm direct. I've always been direct. If you talk to my friends, my families, my allies, my opponents, I don't mince words because I grew up around politicians who wanted to tell you what you wanted to hear, but not tell you the truth. And I was raised to believe that you tell the truth. People may not like it, but they can never say they didn't hear it. And more importantly, as a woman of color, as a black woman, and as a person of color, I cannot be shy about my response because any hint that I don't think I'm qualified, that I don't think we can, is used as a justification for saying that we can't. And so my responsibility is larger than simply answering the question about my personal ambition. This isn't about ambition for me. It's about ambition for our people, that we should be considered and should be elevated to a place where we can help represent and serve our communities. That said, what I believe should happen in 2020 to win is simple. We have to win those blue wall states, but we also have to expand the map because we keep, if we keep playing the last election while the other side is running the next election, we will mm -hmm. continue to fall behind. And the thing is we need someone who can not only win Saginaw and Racine and Scranton, we need to win Detroit and Milwaukee and Philadelphia. But we also need to win Phoenix and Atlanta and Durham because we need to pick up Senate seats. If we want to see real change, we have to not only win the White House, we have to win the Senate. To my own benefit and my own qualifications, in 2018, I led the single highest turnout of voters of color in the nation. Not by rate, but by number. Because I ran the kind of campaign that we all need to be running which is that we need to reach out and recognize that persuasion isn't about simply persuading a Republican or an independent to vote Democratic. It's also persuading those who share our ideology to do something about it. And if they do not hear themselves spoken about during a campaign, they have the legitimate choice to say, I'm not going to risk myself and risk my fears by taking a step. So my belief is that I, am, I have proven over 25 years a capacity and a competence for doing the work but I also know that we have to win elections. And I believe that what we saw in 2018 in Georgia and around the country is that if we have the broadest vision of who can be part of our coalition, we will win in 2020. So thank you. And, um, and I wanna just end um, by um, having you talk, talk to us a little bit about how you're doing, how your family's doing, <laughs> how are you taking care of yourself? Um, what, if, if, have, you, have you learned anything that you can share with me? I'm, I'm here. Um, in my apartment, um, I'm never here that much. I'm always on the road. And, um, and I'm actually like, sort of, you know, talking, starting to talk to myself daily um, <laughs> in ways that, um, and, and answering myself back. So any tips, any, anything, um, and also just how, how are you and your family and, and, and the people um, at Fair Fight doing? Well, first of all, my great grandmother told Mumu, we called her Mumu. She said, it's perfectly fine to talk to yourself. Just don't ask yourself what you said. <laughs> so if that's your metric, if that's what you get to, you might want to call somebody. Yeah. But until then, you're good. Mm -hmm. 
my family, most of my family is here in Georgia, my immediate family. I have a brother in California and a sister in Kentucky, but we're all staying in close touch. We have a Zoom call with my sisters and my mom once a week. We talk to my nieces and nephews. So we're, we're doing well. And my concern, though, is for those who don't have that close contact. I have cousins who've been diagnosed with COVID-19, and I have distant family members who are suffering. And my worry is that I have the benefit and the privilege of being able to take care of myself and my immediate family, but I don't know that I can do for everyone. And so that's one of my, the moments of my urgency is to think about how do we serve not just those we love and know, but how do we serve those we are connected to? And I think one of the ways we resettle ourselves is by knowing that we're doing the most we can in the moment where we are to reach as many as possible. Doing something like this podcast or this, I'm sorry, this webinar is important to me because it's hard to think about how you can help. There's a paralysis that sets in that we are, because we are quarantined, because we're on lockdown, that we are isolated from the future, but we're not. And if we think about the ways we can create change, the ways the Fair Fight Action Team, the Fair Fight 2020 team, the way my Fair Count team and our Southern Economic Advancement Project teams, they're all actively at work reaching out and thinking about not just today, but what does tomorrow look like? Mm -hmm. On our side of the aisle, on our side of the conversation, on the side of progress, we have to stop waiting for others to come and save us. And I love this organization because you daily provide people with the ammunition to help change their lives. And I wanted to lift up Fair Fight and Fair Count and SEEP because those are other ways people can get engaged. A small bit of change changes the world and massive change changes the future. That is what we can do together. And I'm just so excited to be a part of the universe that you've created to make it so. Well, thank you so much, Stacey, for joining us. I hope people will visit Fair Fight, uh, Fair Count. Um, I hope people will visit us at theblackresponse.org to take immediate actions, both at the federal and state level, to sign petitions, make phone calls, join us in those efforts, theblackresponse.org. Um, we will put all of these um, you know, websites up um, and platforms up, uh, you know, on on colorofchange.org's um, um, Facebook, YouTube, and um, an Instagram account, so you all can sort of see and follow um, and engage in those efforts. But um, thank you not only for sharing with us sort of a lot of deep policy. Um, a lot of sort of understanding of the political landscape of the fight and the challenge that is happening in the South, uh, a place where Black people are disproportionately living, oftentimes are, um, are not, the stories are not covered and are, and are living um, oftentimes under political leadership that have treated us like enemy combatants. And in so many ways, um, the urgency of fighting for, um, Fighting for a better tomorrow is what keeps me going in the midst of all this. And it is so great that it, to hear that it keeps you going. And, and uh, I hope that we um, can continue to have this conversation. I hope that um, we can continue to stay in touch as the new things come down the pike for you. But all of that to say, stay healthy, my friend, stay safe, keep fighting, and we are fighting with you. Hey, you too. Th fighting. Thank you. Take care.